You ever wonder why some characters seem to bring out the best or worst in others? That's where the concept of a foil comes in. That's right. So what is a foil? How to use foils to develop characters? Well, <coughs> sorry. I'm going to break down the term foil and how you can use this powerful tool to highlight key traits in your characters and make your narrative even more dynamic. Before we get started, foil is not what you wrap around your chicken to make sure that it cooks evenly in the oven. No, foil is completely different. But Thomas, why is a foil important? Well, that's a great question. See, a foil is a character whose traits contrast with another character, typically the protagonist, in order to highlight certain qualities or flaws. The foil doesn't have to be the villain or the antagonistic force. They can be a side character, even a friend, or believe it or not, a random encounter. The goal is to create contrast so that we can see your main character's traits more clearly. Often a foil will highlight strengths or weaknesses and can be done with a subtle or obvious approach. Think of it like this. If your protagonist is calm and reserved, a foil might be someone who's rash and impulsive. That contrast makes the protagonist's traits stand out even more. The foil can emphasize the protagonist's strengths, but it can also shine a light on their weaknesses. Am I right? You want, uh, you want opportunity, okay, for contrast uh, to basically show your protagonist's traits by providing chances for them to make choices and present their traits in contrast to the actual foil. Now, you always want opposing positions to speak so you can uh, so you don't end up uh, with a narrative that is uh, only presenting one side of the conversation because then it's the, that's where you get the, this sounds kind of preachy. Like if everyone's like, you know, red is the greatest color in the world and everybody's like, yeah, red is the best color. And this character, red, red. No one, no one, not one person says, well, I don't know. Royal purple's pretty nice. Or, you know, I like forest green. Everyone's like, red is great, right? Then it gets a little preachy. So you need these opposing positions uh, to create a dynamic to the discussion or conversation. This is how you take a theme and you could elevate a theme by showing different variations on that theme. Is killing right or is killing wrong? You know, like, how, well, depending on the situation. Now we have different perspectives, right? A foil is ultimately doing that and creating opportunities for it to physically be shown the opposition to whatever the trait is of the character. You know, so if the character is patient, as they say, and the other character is rash and or um, or annoying. And you see the main protagonist just being able to handle it and not being upset by it and able to kind of just have empathy for that character. You're seeing the, fo the foil is emphasizing the traits, right? Now, when characters are able to make choices or their positions change completely somewhat or not at all, it allows for character development. So these interactions between the protagonist and their foil often drive character that growth <clears throat> drives character to grow and change uh basically elevating and moving their arcs now more importantly every scene needs some form of conflict tension or stakes i'll repeat that every scene needs some form of conflict tension or stakes and a foil is a great opportunity for conflict to come from their differences in positions or their traits to create tension and conflict driving the plot forward additionally it helps highlight theme exploration and give a bit more complexity to characters it's these opportunities to see their traits positions <clears throat> and working through relationships by making choices that really create and add nuance and complexity to the story. Now, these elements help to make the narrative feel more realistic, which in turn makes it more engaging for the audience. <clears throat> for example, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is uh, traditionally shown as logical and reserved in the, in, the, in the comics. In the novel, he's also logical and reserved. And Dr. Watson has empathy and he's grounded. <clears throat> Those are two opposite examples, right? So you want to be able to play off of those. Another another would be Jon Snow and Theon Greyjoy, right? They have uh, opposing things. So upbringing. Both were raised by the Starks, but Jon as Ned's illegitimate son <coughs> and Theon as a ward slash hostage 
This similar yet different status shapes their characters distinctively. Ooh, sorry about that. Additionally, their identity, right? If you look at their identity, John struggles with his bastard status, but maintains a strong sense of honor, while Theon grapples with his divided loyalties between the Starks and his birth family, the Greyjoys. Spoiler alert if you uh, haven't seen or read. Choices. When it comes to their choices, their positions, John consistently chooses duty and honor, which is a position, even at great personal cost. Theon often makes choices driven by his desire for acceptance and recognition, leading to betrayal and regret. What about character arcs? Now, John's arc is one of rising to leadership and embracing his identity, while Theon's is one of fall, redemption, and the struggle to reclaim his identity. And ultimately, the relationship to the Stark's family. John, though not a true-born Stark, remains loyal to his family's values. Theon, on the other hand, raised alongside the Stark children, ultimately betrays them before seeking a redemption. All right, so these foiled relationships highlights themes of identity, loyalty, and the consequences of one's choices, which are central to the series. Their contrasting journeys provide depth to the narrative and often different perspectives. Now, a couple of things real quick. There are times when John is not on the page with Theon, right? And Theon is not on the page with John, but their traits still act as foils to one another because when we see John behaving and then we see Theon behaving, they are contrasts and they both came from the same household. Sort of like that uh, psychological uh, <clears throat> question, uh, not question, but uh, scenario where a reporter goes to a twin and he says to him, how come you're really successful and your brother is a murderer and in prison? And the brother says, well, I don't know. You got to ask. Uh, why don't you ask our father? So the reporter goes and he actually goes and asks the other twin in prison the same question. Why are you in prison for murdering people and your brother's really successful? And the twin says, I don't know. Why don't you go ask our father? Right. So. <clears throat> They are ultimately different foils. Do they have different upbringings, even though they're in the same environment? Because the way they perceive the world and the, the choices they make as a character. So you can see that, too. So it emphasizes John's honor by seeing how he performs despite, you know, the other things. That's why it's really interesting when uh, he joins the, uh, the Wildlings and he has to dishonor his vow by being like, I am no longer a knight of the black, right? I am no longer the, what, what, the, the, the watch, the night watch, whatever. Because he's actually just going undercover, but he's being challenged to break his vow. And then, like, him falling in love with the, uh, the redhead. And uh, <clears throat> all that is a challenge because he vowed to, to never be with a woman, et cetera, et cetera. So. He also is with a woman later on in the show version. I'm not sure that's going to happen in the books, though. All right, close that out. Boop, 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 boop. All right, let's do a walkthrough real quick. Walkthrough. Uh, look, I'm the first to tell you that listing out traits or ideas for characters is not my favorite way of approaching characters. I like to uh, develop my characters through arcs as I develop them on the page, all that said. With that said, uh, here are some ways uh, you can figure out when and where a foil might be beneficial to your narrative, starting with your protagonist key traits. Now, something you should keep in mind is uh, you want to identify your character's traits. Uh, you know, what are they? Uh, even, if, even if you start with one, right? If I had a character name, let's say Alice, and I'm noticing that she's a strategic thinking thinker, and always shows a calm demeanor under pressure, I might want to challenge both those elements. The fact that she uh, is a thinker, uh, she's strategic, and she has a calm demeanor, right? This is when I can look at the other characters and have to decide if one or more of the other characters are natural foils. If I have to develop a position or trait counters to Alice within one of those characters, or if the narrative would benefit from a new character 
who is a direct foil to Alice. So these are things that you should be asking yourself. So once you look at your character and you can figure out what their traits are, and by the way, you don't have to figure out what their traits are before you write. This is something you could read and go, you know, I see what their traits are. I see what their, their personalities are. And you could write that down and you could say, are they being challenged? Right. But more importantly, do I have people that are opposite to these things or counter opposite or slightly opposite? Right. They, they don't have to be completely opposite. They could be variations. Right. Anyway, step two. Use the foil to highlight strengths and flaws. All right. So, by the way, I, I'm going to do a real time example. I just I'm just sort of reading through these things. Uh, so. Step two, uh, it's time to actually create the foil, right? So the process is fairly easy. Uh, what you do next is take your character's traits and see what they are doing or not doing. For Alice, I suggested that maybe that uh, she's a strategic thinker. And uh, she also has a calm demeanor under pressure, which means that I can now take my other characters or direct foil character to her and allow them to push back on her strategic ideas. In fact, I could even have them agree with the strategic plan and then make a choice while they're implementing it that forces Alice to have to adjust her plan. So basically, if Alice is like, we're going to go through, uh, there's three doors. And Alice is like, uh, listen, I'm reading the paper. The paper says that if we go through the, the, the furthest le door on the left, that will lead to the place. And then the foil's like, I think that's a good idea. Um, However, I think we should go through the second door. And then Alice is like, uh, no, because we will die. Uh, we have to go through this door. And then the character's like, okay, no problem. And then as they're going, the second character runs through the, the foil, runs through the second door going because of fear. They're like, no, I have to, I believe in myself. I don't, I, I don't believe you. And then that causes an issue. So now the other two doors lock. Whatever case happens, the, the ceiling starts closing down and they have to go through the second door uh, and deal with whatever the consequences are. So that's an example of throwing some characters under the bus, one might say. <laughs> All right. Why don't we keep the foil dynamic? Now, again, a foil doesn't have to be a static character either. They can grow, evolve, or even mirror the protagonist in unexpected ways. Maybe as the story progresses, the foil to Alice learns to be more cautious while Alice starts taking more risks. Right? That creates an interesting dynamic. Uh, these slight changes help to add uh, depth to both characters and creates a more engaging dynamic between them and the narrative. All right. exercise time all right so i'm going to write out a passage with the protagonist making choices and showing behavior okay so alice uh <clears throat> moves with her back to the uh cold stone of the cave wall holding close to it the knowledge uh, cave in, uh, um, uh, historical cave, cave ins. All right, <coughs> three, uh, three of her closest friends follow uh, behind her, maintaining. Her position, her movement, staying close, uh, close to the edge. All right, then we go. Oop, what happened? Man, why did it do that? Why does it do that? Why does it see? So weird. Anyway. So weird. All right. Okay, so Alice moved with her back to the... Let's make this a little bit bigger. 
Alice moved to uh, with her back to the cold stone of the moves with her back against the cold stone of the cave wall, holding close to it with her knowledge of historic cavens. That might actually be a uh... anyway. Three of her closest friends followed behind behind her, maintaining her movement and staying close to the edge. Dave held the light, the the torch torchlight uh, in the back of the group uh, shivering at the sounds deep inside the cave itself all right okay uh, they close to me don't make too much noise Alice whispered. And we have to know she's whispering, otherwise she'd be the one making noise, right? All right. Alice whispered, turning toward the line of friends. Uh, each, okay. <clears throat> each nodded in agreement. All right, so there we go. Right out of passage with the protagonist making choices and showing behavior, right? So Alice moves with her back against the thing, so that's a choice, right? Holding close to the wall with her knowledge of historical cavens. Uh, three of her closest friends follow behind her, maintaining her movement and staying close to the edge. All right. Her experience showed in the way she crossed one foot over the other, staying in a straight line away from the cave of uh, the tunnel center. All right. Dave held the torchlight in the back of the group, shivering at the sounds deep inside the cave itself. His free hand. Oh. His one hand is his left hand. Remain steady on Robin's shoulder. Uh, keeping him keeping him uh, secure in the right direction. All right, anyway. Let's get rid of this. Okay, so there you go. That's the scene. All right, so the exercise is to basically write out a passage, right, like this. Okay, now we want to go back and we sort of want to uh, discover. We want to read through the passage and figure out how to push back against the protagonist. Okay, right? so Alice moved with her back against the cold stone of the cave wall, holding close to it with her knowledge of historical cavens. So I might want to challenge that. There's going to definitely be cave-ins. Three of her closest friends file behind her, maintaining her movement and staying close to the edge. I could make them have to uh, separate. Okay. Her experience showed in the way she crossed one foot over the other, staying in a straight line away from the tunnel zone. Okay. All right. So I could definitely challenge this and this. Right? So those two things. I could challenge those things. Dave held the torchlight in the back of the group, shivering at the sound. Uh, sounds emanating deep inside the cave. Ho, 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 ho. All right. His left hand remained steady on Robin's shoulder, keeping him secure in the right direction. Stay close to me. Don't move. Make too much noise. All right. Right direction. Okay. Each. Uh. They nodded in agreement to her, shuffling their feet uh, through the loose sand and gravel. All right. <clears throat> so now I think I'm going to challenge this first. So cave-ins, right? Let's see. Now Dave is going to be the foil. Because he is the unexperienced one, and Alice is the experienced one. So now Dave... All right. 
Dave. Is it Dave? Yeah, Dave. All right. Dave Jolts. At the squeals. Echoing. Uh, the black. The distant black of darkness uh, in darkness. David jolted at the squeals echoing from the distant black of the darkness. <laughs> what was that? He stuttered, uh, shifting his weight around, uh, uh, shifting, shifting his torch around each each movement flickered the light all right <clears throat> each movement flickered the light uh, calm down it's not Uh, Alice, stop trying to quiet uh, the unexperienced cave explorer. Okay, so now, now we're okay. So now I want to get Dave to do something. So Dave is uh, that's not bad. It's, they're too loud. Uh, his voice rising. Rising. Raising? Rising. Rising. Is it raising or rising? Listen, I'm just a writer. Okay. Uh, that's not bad. They're too loud. His voice rising. Oh, his voice rose. Rose. Or raised. Uh... Stumbling into the center of the tunnel. He, okay. All right. Rub and grabbed for him as he fell back onto the ground. Mm -hmm. All right. Fell back onto the ground with a crack and rumble. The ceiling uh, shifted dust down upon on the group. Okay. Anyway. Shifted. All right. So I've already started the challenge. I don't want to get too deep into it. Let me make this a little small. So can... All right. So now I'm challenging the first thing. This is creating the foil, right? So Alice moving. So she's experienced. She's telling us to stay a little quiet. She's calm and collective. But uh, Dave is not. And Dave has already started. He fell into the center. And now something crazy is going to happen, right? So the, th so <clears throat> the exercise so far is to sort of write a scene or even look at one of your own scenes. And as you read it, find something. So what is it she, she or he is doing? that is showcasing a trait, right? And, uh, you know, move with her back against the cult. So this is showing that she is experienced, right? And then um, three of her closest friends file behind, maintaining her movement to stay close to the edge. Staying close to the edge. Near the edge. Her experience sh showed in the way she... So we know she's experienced. So we want to challenge that by showing someone unexperienced. So then she can make choices to save him or not save him. All right. Then once you have something written out or you're looking at your piece and you identified a, a, a direct trait or ability, I should say, a direct trait or an ability, uh, you know, or whatever, or a position, uh, read through the passage and figure out how to push back against it like we just did. You know, we we're like, oh, you know what? Let's just let's put Dave into peril. Right. And then the third thing you want to do is basically rework the scene to have the protagonist and foil move on the page. And basically what what we're doing is we have we could have Alice 
uh, uh, rushing toward Dave. Alice jumped the remaining distance, knowing he had seconds before the ground uh, caved in on itself. Uh, she landed a few feet away with her hand, her arm stretched out. Grab my hand. Whoop, let me get me out of there. All right. She called out, looking back at Robin. My feet. Robin, uh, oh, kneeling down, Robin, uh, secured Alice's, Al, alive. Alice's feet, uh, positioning herself. Uh, positioning herself for the ready, or something like that. All right, the ground shift, shifted, and shook beneath uh, Dave's uh, weight. Uh, falling as he reached, reached out and grabbed. Alice's hand. Okay. His body fell in, pulling her arm. Twat. All right. All right. Twat. Twat. Yeah, stretched a pull. Uh, twat. Hmm. Her loud grunt. And gave way to the pain, ripping through, uh, ripping along her, her shoulder. Hold, hold on. He struggled. Oh, hold on. She struggled. All right, so there you go. All right, and we reworked the scene to show the foil in motion. So we're seeing her saving him. We're seeing so that's that's really the secret to uh you know trying to add um some elements of a foil because you might not have characters challenging just naturally or opposing or showing um counter traits and positions from your main character. And all you have to do is go through and recognize what traits your character has, be it uh, strengths or weaknesses. Okay, maybe maybe they have a strong position on something. Maybe they're really good at sword fighting. Maybe they're, uh, I don't know, really good at direction. Whatever the case may be. And then you allow yourself to say, all right, if I have this character with these strengths and these weaknesses... How do I elevate them? Do I have characters that oppose these? Do I have characters that aren't good at sword fighting? So then we could allow the character to showcase their skill as a sword fighter. Um, you know, uh, all right, she's really good at uh, figuring out direction. So maybe there's a character that's always getting lost, right? So it's up to you to look at the page and start taking notes and identifying where your character, your main protagonist has strengths and where they have weaknesses, because you don't necessarily have to adjust them saying, oh, wait, she has too many strengths or too many, too many weaknesses, right? What, what could you do with a foil? Well, you could take the foil and emphasize those strengths and weaknesses. And then through the narrative, you could adjust your protagonist's strengths and weaknesses through the foil and maybe they could switch places maybe the foil starts learning better direction or maybe um maybe the main protagonist gets hurt and uh you know they're in and out their days and they can't really you know they got hit really hard and they're they're, they're sort of conscious but uh, you know obviously they can't decide where they are directionally so now the uh, foil gets a chance to sort of use the skills they've developed throughout the now narrative and they're able to find their way home so, you know, like you, you can play with it that way. With that said, final thoughts. Again, a really short final thoughts today. 
Uh, foils are a great way to bring out the deeper aspects of your characters without having to rely on exposition by showing how they handle challenges in contrast to other characters. You give the reader a clearer view of their personality, strengths, and flaws. That's what makes foils a powerful tool in a writer's arsenal. That would be you. Okay. When a this tool helps with offering a fun way. All right. To uh, add nuance development of your characters and enrich your specific narrative. When approaching your foils relationship with the protagonist or any character, keep show sometimes tell in mind as behavior is going to enrich the presentation of their traits, positions, and choices. Behavior is always going to be more interesting than saying this character is smart. Remember, the goal of using foils isn't just to create contrast, but to deepen your reader's understanding of your characters and the world they inhabit. When used effectively, foils can transform your story, adding layers of meaning and engagement that keep readers invested in your character's journey. As you continue to write and develop your characters, look for opportunities to introduce foils. They don't always have to be a major character. Sometimes a brief interaction with a contrasting personality can illuminate aspects of your protagonist in powerful ways. Ultimately, mastering the use of foils is about understanding the intricacies of human relationships and the ways in which we define ourselves in relationships to others. By honing this skill, you're not just creating more interesting characters, you're crafting a more authentic and compelling narrative world. So, as you move forward with your writing, consider how foils can enhance your character development, drive your plot, and deepen your themes with practice and attention you'll find that foils become an indispensable part of your storytelling toolkit helping you create richer more engaging stories that resonate deeply with your readers and there you go. next video in the series novellas we're going to just basically what is a novella that's what we're going to explain what is a novella uh, if you haven't done so already and you really love what you're watching, uh, please subscribe and hit the bell icon. And if you've enjoyed and found this information helpful, uh, give me a thumbs up. It uh, really helps the, uh, the channel grow. You know? I'd like to also say, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I want to write out my scripts anymore. You know, this is, this is real time, like, uh, back and forth, you know, like, do I want to write out my scripts or do I want to like, I could bullet point my scripts. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Be like, do you like the scripts? Do you like that I just, I read my scripts where I'm like, I just write out what I want to talk about. And then I, I riff on it. You know, when I look at the camera, I'm riffing. But uh, let me know. Do you, do you like that I have a written out lesson that I just kind of like, you know, it's been, uh, it's almost uh, next, it's been two and a half years. So, uh, you know. Always places to improve yourself. I'm uh I'm always happy to have be critiqued. Whatever. Anyway. All right, that was a little aside. I I appreciate that. Uh, you know, as always, to you out there, peace and harmony, truth and action. Keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Bye.